Uh, great to have you uh, here, Professor Howell. I'm very grateful that you accepted our invitation. So, uh, yep. Yes. So, good day, everyone. I say good day because there are people from different time zones here. So, it might be morning or evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Sankal Pohra, and I'm a master's student studying philosophy at Ashoka University. I welcome you all to this philosophy workshop titled Locating Subjectivity in the Study of Consciousness, organized by the Department of Philosophy at Ashoka University. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Ashoka University is one of India's leading liberal arts and sciences universities, and it has been ranked in the top five among private universities in India by QS Asia, and has also secured top rank among all Indian universities in the International Faculty Indicator. In a very limited uh, time, Ashoka has built for itself a reputation of having strong emphasis on research output and academic excellence. This workshop consists of three talks by very eminent philosophers from around the world, as the workshop aims to bring together various perspectives on the topic of consciousness and subjectivity with the hope to further the discussion about topics such as introspection, self, and perception, which are at the heart of issues pertaining to the subjectivity of conscious experience. I'm extremely delighted to introduce the second speaker of the workshop. Uh, Robert Howell is a professor of philosophy at the Southern Methodist University, where he's also the department chair. His research interests lie in the fields of philosophy of mind, epistemology, and metaphysics. He has co-authored and uh, co-edited various books uh, on the topic, uh, select few titles are uh, the likes of Self-Awareness and the Elusive Subject, which is an upcoming, like forthcoming book. Um, he's also uh, written Consciousness and the Limits of Objectivity, The Case for Subjective Physicalism. This uh, is a book which is particular to like a thesis that I'm working on, so I'm very excited about his talk. And Consciousness and the Mind-Body Problem. I'm very grateful for Professor Howell to have accepted our invitation. Uh, before Professor Howell begins his talk, just a few housekeeping points to note. After Professor Howell finishes his presentation, the flow will be uh, like, uh, we will have uh, Professor Tatiana Kostochka giving her commentary, after which the flow will be open to a Q&A session. Um, please keep your questions short and crisp for the benefit of both the speaker and the audience. Uh, during the talk, kindly keep your mics on mute, and if possible, kindly switch on your cameras, for it makes for a more interactive and engaging session. Uh, this talk is being recorded and will be posted on the university's YouTube channel for those who aren't able to join us for today's call. Uh, Professor Havel, the stage is yours. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, Sankov, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm honored to be a part of it. And uh, thanks to Shoki University for holding this interesting uh, conference. Uh, and thanks in advance to Professor Kostoska for uh, her comments. I know that I'm going to uh, learn a lot, um, especially since she actually knows what she's talking about when she talks about Buddhism, and I, I don't. Um, so uh, the topic that we're going to um, kind of spend a little time with is one that's puzzled me for a long time. Uh, and that is basically the question about the elusiveness of the self or the subject. Um, so a lot of philosophers have felt both that the subject of experience is something that is um, very um, obvious and certain that there has to be such a thing as a subject of experience. Um, you know, following Descartes, they think, I think therefore I am is just as certain as can be. And therefore there must be an I that is doing the thinking um, but at the same time, they feel like there's something elusive about the self. They can't find it. So that's basically what I'm going to try to um, explore, um, the sense in which the self or the subject is elusive. Uh, and I also want to say a little bit about why I think that um, I think that there has to be something like a subject or a self. Uh, so let me share my screen and see if we can get this going. <clears throat> All right, does that look okay, everybody? Great. Um, so probably uh, at least in 
sort of uh, analytic or Western philosophy, the most famous statement of the elusiveness of the self comes from Hume, who says, for my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never catch myself at any time without a perception and never can observe anything but the perception. Uh, so presumably he looks like when he's talking about entering most intimately into what he calls himself, he seems to be talking about introspection. Uh, and so I'm not gonna sort of uh, overemphasize that fact, but it is worth knowing that, you know, there's plenty of people who think that if you're looking for the self, looking for it in introspection isn't the right way to go. Um, I'm gonna stay with Hume though, and think that that's the sort of uh, elusiveness or at least the sort of uh, access to the self that we find suspiciously missing. Um, so uh, in my limited understanding of Buddhism, here's uh, a quote that uh, looks like it says very much the same thing, um, that given any form, material form, whatever, whether past, future, present, internal, external, gro gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a bhikkhu has seen all material form and as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And through not clinging, he is liberated. Any kind of feeling whatsoever, any kind of perception, whatever, any kind of formations, whatever, any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past or future or present, a bhikkhu has seen all consciousness and is actually is with proper wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Um, I think that that's actually kind of remarkably similar to what Hume said much, much later. Uh, and then uh, somebody who's actually been a particular influence on me, uh, despite his uh, relative uh, difficulty, in, uh, in understanding him uh, is Sartre. Uh, and he says, there is no I on the unreflected level. When I run after a street car, when I look at the uh, time, when I'm absorbed in contemplating a portrait, there is no I. There's consciousness of the street car having to be overtaken, etc., and non-positional consciousness of consciousness. But me, I have disappeared. <clears throat> so, before I go much further, I want to say a little bit about what it is that I mean by the self, um, because you can mean all sorts of things by self, and I don't want to commit myself to something very significant here, really. Um, in particular, what I have in mind is the self as the subject of experience, um, and not necessarily a substance on its own, like, so I want to basically remain uh, metaphysically agnostic about whether this is going to be a substance or a bundle. Um, and I also want to remain agnostic on whether it's the sort of thing that endures throughout one's life and makes a person quote unquote who they are. Um, so I think that, you know, one thing that you could take um, from my understanding, um, Buddhism as rejecting is the latter idea that there's this thing that endures throughout oneself that makes one who one is. Um, and if that's what um, is being rejected, then I'm not necessarily in disagreement with the people who reject the existence of a self. Um, but uh, I do think that there is something that is having the experiences, um, and that's what I have in mind by the subject. And I'll probably get a little clear about that as I proceed. Um, so my thesis is that there is a sense in which the subject of experience is especially elusive, and that there's nonetheless a subject of experience. I want to just linger for just a second on the first. Um, I want it to be the case that the subject of experience is actually especially elusive in the sense that it's elusive in a way that, for example, tables and chairs are not. Um, so we're going to see that actually Hume could be taken to be saying that tables and chairs in some sense are elusive as well. Um, and um, I want it to be the case that the subject of experience is elusive in the way that mental states don't seem like they're or conscious mental states don't seem like they're elusive. And we're going to see that Shoemaker thinks that there's a sense in which those things uh, can be elusive. So I want the self to be the subject to, to be particularly elusive. I want to start, though, with the sort of positive part of the project, um, because maybe if you don't think that there's such a thing as a subject in the first place, you're not going to be very impressed with the idea that the subject of experience is elusive. Um, so I want to quickly sort of refute what I take to be, or take myself to refute, what I take to be one of the classic sort of critiques, at least within the Western tradition, of the cogito, which might be taken to be a proof of the existence of a self or something like this. 
And so here's what Lichtenberg is taken to has said. Um, Descartes is not justified in saying, I am thinking, but only in saying there is thinking, so therefore making it subjectless. Just as we aren't justified in saying there's something raining when we say it is raining, we are justified in saying there's something thinking when we find there is thinking. And this looks like it questions the existence of a subject or self or a thing that thinks. Um, I'm going to suggest that this is not quite right, um, that this can't be quite right. Um, one way to kind of, you know, respond to this in somewhat of a foot stomping manner is just to say, you know, something has to have experiences. Their experiences can't be just free range. There can't be, you know, feelings of pain without something feeling pain. There can't be thoughts of history without there being something that thinks about history. Um, and I do think that that's, I find that to be fairly persuasive, but that does seem a little bit dogmatic. And so uh, I want to basically rehearse an argument that I, I found initially in Chisholm, but I think you can find it in Williams and elsewhere. And it's what I'll call the elimination argument. And the basic idea behind the elimination argument is that if it's the case that there is no subject of experience, um, then it should be the case that we should be able to talk about these sorts of things like uh, thoughts, um, sensations, uh, conscious states in a neutral manner that actually doesn't personalize them, that actually doesn't relativize them to a self. So here's, so we might want to say with Lichtenberg, for example, that, you know, there is thinking, or there is a headache, or there is somebody um, thinking about the self. So here's premise one, if the self is a fiction, we should be able to substitute I am sentences with there are sentences with no loss of meaning. Um, so the I should be eliminable. Um, but it doesn't seem like we can. So for example, when Tom says I have a headache and Tim says I don't have a headache, it looks like they're not contradicting each other. But if Tom says there is a headache and Tim says there is no headache, they do contradict each other. So the idea here is, is that if we just substitute there is for whenever anybody says I, then we wind up having statements that look like they are perfectly consistent um, being inconsistent because you know it looks like Tom could very well have a headache and say there is a headache, but Tom, Tim is not wrong when he says, I don't have a headache. Um, he is wrong, however, if he says there is no headache. Um, so this suggests that you can't just eliminate the eye. And the, what sort of self or subject does this argument prove, if it proves anything? Well, I think it'll prove a very thin self or subject in the following sense. The subject is just that in virtue of which multiple mental states can be said to be had by one thing rather than another. It just provides, as it were, the place. Uh, I'm going to say for conscious states, because I think conscious states are the things that most um, perspicuously demand a place, although that's worth discussing. And so you might think of the self as just being um, sort of a relativization point for mental state descriptions. Um, so that when, you know, I say I have a headache, we want to relativize that to something. Um, and I want to call that the subject. When Tim says he doesn't have a headache, we want to relativize that statement and look at a particular domain to determine whether or not that's true. And that domain is going to be sort of circumscribed by his subjectivity or his being a subject. So that's my um, sort of follow up on Descartes. Uh, proof and uh, a uh, supposed response to Lichtenberg. Um, so what's wrong with the just claiming that this thing is elusive? Well, one worry when you talk about the elusiveness of the self is that it may look like other things are elusive in the same way. So a little bit uh, in another part of the treatise, Hume says the following about substance. Um, I would fain ask those philosophers who found so much of their reasonings on the distinction of substance and accident, and imagine we have a clear idea of each, whether the idea of substance be derived from the impression of a sensation or reflection. If it be conveyed to us by our senses, I ask which of them after what manner. If, be, if it be perceived by the eyes, it must be a color, by the ears a sound, with the palate of taste, and so the other senses. But I believe none will assert that substance is either a color, a sound, or a taste. The idea of substance must therefore be derived from an impression of reflection, but the impression of reflection will resolve themselves into our passions and emotions, 
none of which can possibly represent a substance. We have therefore no idea of a substance distinct from that of a collection of particular qualities, nor have we any other meaning when we talk or reason concerning it. Now, this quote from Hume looks like it presupposes his particular sort of empiricist view about the derivation of concepts coming from just sensations and ideas and reflections upon those. Um, but it looks as though we can we don't have to sort of have his particular empiricist um, methodology or view about the derivation of our ideas to see his point, which is that, of course, when we see a table, we just see its properties. And it's not like, you know, when you subtract the properties, we see some table underneath. And so you might think this is very similar to what he's saying about the subject, or is that if you take away the thoughts, if you take away the smells and the pains and the feelings, that we don't find anything underlying them. If that analogy holds, if that's really the same thing he's saying in both cases, then it looks like at least Hume's case for the elusiveness of the self looks like it's intertwined in such a way with his view of perceiving objects that it doesn't look like we perceive tables or chairs either. We perceive a bunch of different properties that tables or chairs have, but we don't perceive the tables or chairs themselves that have them. And so I would actually take this to be a challenge to my version of the elusiveness thesis, because I want it to be the case that the subject is particularly elusive. And so if it turns out that it's no more elusive than tables or chairs. I'm a little concerned about that. Well, I think that um, Sidney Shoemaker, whose contributions to this topic um, are hard to overestimate. Um, I think Shoemaker pushes something like this himself in the form of a dilemma. I think what he thinks is the self is not particularly elusive because there's either there's really two sorts of views that you could mean when you're talking about perceiving the self. Uh, when you're talking about looking in and trying to find the self, he thinks that you're ultimately talking about perceiving the self. And you mean one of two things by that. You either mean a broad view of perception, in which case he thinks the self is available to introspection and you do find it, or it's the case that there is a more narrow view in mind, in which case he thinks that conscious states are elusive as well. So let's say a little bit more about each of those. So basically what Shoemaker is asking us to do is he's asking us to come up with a sense in which the self is elusive. And he wants to say, the only sense in which the self is elusive is gained by sort of having an ambiguity between, between, between different senses of perception. Um, and so on one view, to perceive something is just to perceive a property of it. Um, so he thinks that it's clear that, you know, we perceive tables by perceiving their shape. We perceive them by perceiving their color. We perceive the bendings of, we perceive branches by perceiving the bendings of branches. And that that just is what it is to perceive an object. Um, and it looks like on a natural conception of the metaphysics of conscious states, um, conscious states are just modifications of the subject that has them. Um, they modify the subject of their properties of the subject, much in the same way that the brown is the property of the table or the bending of the branch is the property of the branch. Um, you could say that they're you know, adjectival, you could say that they're adverbial. Um, it doesn't matter as long as they're modifications of the subject itself. It looks like this is just a way of perceiving the self. Now, one could reject that view and could say, well, these things aren't modifications of the subject. But I don't want to reject that view, not only because I'm inclined to believe it, um, but also because of the fact that um, I don't really want to be metaphysically committal. Uh, when I'm defending the elusiveness of the self. So uh, I prefer for my defense uh, of the elusiveness to not depend upon anything controversial. So he thinks that maybe you have another sense of perception in mind, in which case the, sense, the self does turn out to be elusive. Um, and this is a case, and he has a fairly complicated set of things that are involved in perception in this sense. Um, but he thinks that perception in this sense involves having sense impressions of a thing. So perceiving X involves having sense impressions of it, having identifying information about that thing as a result of the sense impressions, um, being able to misidentify it. So obviously, typically, if I see a table, I represent parts of the table by virtue of having sense impressions of the table. 
I'm able to identify the table and keep track of it by way of having these sense impressions. And I could potentially misidentify it by having misleading sensory states about it. Now, on this view, he says he doesn't, he thinks it's true. We don't have any perception of the subject of experience. Um, none of these things seem to be true about the subject of experience. But he wants to say we don't perceive conscious experiences either on this view. Um, so think about your pains, which look like they're pretty salient phenomenologically. Um, we don't have sense impressions of pain uh, quite plausibly. They are sense impressions. Um, we may or may not have identifying information about them, but we certainly don't have information about them as a result of having sense impressions of them. Uh, we don't represent our states when we have them, we just have them. Um, and quite plausibly, we're not able to misidentify the self or the pains that I'm having. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, I think Shoemaker's going to say, to say, you have a pain, but which pain do you have? So on this broader view of perception, which is the type of perception that might be more um, active in our talk about perception of external objects, he thinks, true, the self is elusive, but it's actually not particularly elusive again because of the fact that it looks like our sensory states aren't either. And so the dilemma then is that Shoemaker thinks that there just is no sense of perception under which it turns out that the self or the subject of experience is particularly elusive. And so um, part of what I take my job to be is to provide a sense in which I think the self is particularly elusive um, that sort of goes between the horns of this dilemma, um, doesn't accept really either view of perception, but suggests uh, some different ways in which it looks like the self doesn't make an appearance in introspection. And so to do that, I want to consider you know, sort of a more general notion, which is a, just a notion of awareness. Um, I fear that sometimes when Shoemaker talks about perceiving things, um, he gets very, um, he gets very litigious about the meanings of perception and what exactly constitutes full-scale perception. And he wants to sort of, you know, outline that particular concept. But it seems to me we have a much broader notion that may include perception as a type, um, but that isn't perception itself, which is just awareness. Um, and the elusiveness thesis, I think, probably is more naturally couched in terms of awareness as opposed to perception. Uh, perception might well be a particularly perspicuous form of awareness. Uh, and it may well be that that particular concept doesn't yield itself very well to certain forms of introspection. So I want to distinguish between at least two sorts of awareness. Actually, I want to distinguish between four. Um, one sort that uh, I think that I, I haven't seen Stoljar's talk, but I know uh, what sorts of things Daniel tends to say, and uh, he might deny the first, I'm not sure, but the first is just phenomenal awareness. There's an awareness we have of our phenomenal states just simply in virtue of having them, right? So, you know, on some level, this seems to be a very uncontroversial thesis that basically what it is to be a phenomenal state just is to be the sort of thing that one has a certain sort of awareness of. Um, now, I should say that by positing such a thing as phenomenal awareness, I'm not saying anything, I think, particularly grandiose. Uh, among other things, one needn't be aware of them as phenomenal states. So um, some people, and I'm including myself in this group, think that in some cases, one projects our phenomenal states outwards, as it were. So um, think about the classic case where Mary is released from her room and she sees a red rose for the first time, right? Well, it seems clear to me that there is a sense in which she becomes aware of something that she wasn't aware of before. Um, now, it, the right way probably for her to describe it is this, the redness of the rose, perhaps. So that may be seem like what it may seem to her like the redness of a rose. But actually, metaphysically, the right way to describe it is she learns something about experiences. She learns that people have a certain experience when they perceive red roses. So the right way to describe the Mary case seems to be a case where she becomes aware of an experience that she previously didn't have, um, even if she's not aware of it as an experience, uh, although Mary, with all her intelligence, certainly would be. But it's just that awareness that I have in mind about phenomenal awareness. 
And that seems like an awareness that we do have of our conscious phenomenal states. It seems paradigmatic. There also seems to be sensory awareness, which is the awareness we have of a property by having a state that represents that property. So presumably, Mary is also representing the redness of the rose by having that experiential state. That's what that redness is doing. Um, and it seems to me like, even if we just take these two senses of awareness, we already get a sense of elusiveness of the subject. And that the subject is not, we're not aware of the subject in either of these senses. Um, it's not the sort of thing that simply by having it, we have some awareness of it, like we could do in the case of phenomenal awareness. And it also looks like we don't, at least we don't obviously, um, represent properties of it by having states that represent those properties. Um, I'd want to say that in the case of having conscious awareness, we just have those properties. We don't represent those properties. But you might say that this is just, so far we just have awareness of properties. We don't have awareness of objects. And part of what you might take Hume to be pushing is this idea that we don't really have awareness of objects. Um, but I don't think that that's quite right. I think that it's actually quite difficult to actually outline a very you know, necessary and sufficient conditioning type of account of object awareness. But I think that um, object awareness is essentially characterized by our ability to think of the thing demonstrably as a that. Um, and I kind of take this from Aristotle, who very early on thinks, uh, says, seems to say that of substances, that they're this is, that they're that's. Um, and oddly, somewhat for Aristotle, he seems to actually seem to have some sort of a phenomenological way to kind of characterize um, these objects. Um, and so we have a way to attend to them in a way that allows them to pick out the object and attend to it as the bearer of those properties. So uh, object awareness isn't just awareness of a thing's properties, in my view. Um, it's awareness of a thing as being the bearer of those properties. And so that could actually come in a handful of ways. Uh, the most obvious way is sensory object awareness. So having a sensory object awareness is having sensory states that represent an object's properties. But you're not just representing the object's properties as being wherever, you're representing them as bound together into an object. So in perceiving a tennis ball, we represent the yellowness as bound with the roundness and the fuzziness. And in the longer version of this paper, I discuss briefly the, um, the binding problem um, in psychology and in, in neuroscience, which is the problem of figuring out why is it the case that when we're perceiving a group of properties that we actually bind them together into objects in the way that, they, that we do. I don't think my particular view necessarily trades off of any particular solution to the binding problem, but the very existence of the binding problem seems to me to point towards something about object awareness. Namely, that it involves a binding of these things as belonging to these properties as belonging to an object. Now, if you kind of drew things into like a little graph, you might have like sensory awareness, phenomenal awareness. Here we have sensory object awareness. It's natural to ask, is there such a thing as phenomenal object awareness? Um, and that would be being aware of phenomenal states as bound together in an object. Um, I think this is a little contentious. Um, I'd be happy to discuss this about whether there are such things. Like it seems to me like there might be cases of after images where we have the sense that basically our phenomenal states are bound together on an object. Um, it's not totally implausible to me to say, in fact, it's somewhat plausibly to say that actually in normal perception, we actually are aware of our phenomenal states is bound together on an object. Um, they're just bound together in an external object. Um, or do we take them to be bound together in an external object? Um, that is because in normal circumstances, I think we often don't take our phenomenal states to be phenomenal states. We take them to be modifications of things that they represent. Um, but the main point is that we're not aware of the subject in any of these senses, in any of these four senses, um, including phenomenal object awareness, whatever that might be. Our numerous phenomenal states are not bound together in such a way that they present or constitute the subject. My headache, the ring of my tinnitus, and my sensation of redness, they don't bind together to present any object at all. That's quite distinct from the way in which the yellowness and the roundness of the tennis ball look like they bind together 
to present an object. And so I want to um, suggest a diagnosis of this and present sort of an analogy that explains what I, the sort of thing that I think is happening here. Um, so I think our conscious states in general don't present the subject because at least for the most part, our conscious states are representational. Um, they direct our attention away from their metaphysical bearer instead to the bearers of the properties they represent. Um, so um, when Mary sees red, she's not like whacked over the head by something that modifies her. She may realize it modifies her, but you know, the red actually directs her to the rose, not to her mind per se. Um, and I think that an interesting analogy is the example of playing a record. So if I play a record, um, let's say a Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, um, there is a sense in which I'm aware of properties of the record. But I think that those properties, even if they are properties of a record, and so I'm not, let's say I'm not watching it turn, I'm not visually looking at it, I'm just listening to the symphony. I think I'm aware of the properties of the record, or at least the properties that are the combination of the record and the needle. And, um, but it looks like I'm aware of violins, I'm aware of horns, I'm aware of an orchestra. Um, I look right through the record and indeed my sounds of the record in order to, to see the orchestra, in order to hear the orchestra rather. Um, and so these properties of the record that I'm aware of, while I'm aware of those properties, they're representational. And so in some sense, they're directing me away from the record. Um, I think that there are probably some postmodern records where like you're supposed to like hear the scratchings on the record and be directed immediately to the record. But in general, that's a bad record. Um, we're wanting to be listening to what the record represents and not the record itself. And so what I want to say is, is that this is um, the diagnosis of why we don't actually have awareness of the self in the way that we might want. So the sense in which the self is elusive is that that basically it isn't, we're not aware of it in either of these senses, any of the four senses that I mentioned. But I think the reason is, and the reason why our phenomenal states aren't bound together in such a way that they present us with the self is that they direct us away from the self instead of to it. And so basically that leads to just sort of my conclusion, which is that I think that it's elusive, the self is elusive in the sense that we're not aware of it. But nevertheless, there must be one, at least in the thin sense of being a relativization point or place for conscious states. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Howell, for your uh, talk. Uh, now, I would like to introduce uh, our commentator, uh, Professor Tatiana Kostochka. Uh, she is an assistant professor of philosophy at Ashoka University, and um, she's done her PhD in philosophy from the University of Southern California. She has also been a visiting researcher at the Research Center for World Buddhist Cultures at Ryokuku University. Uh, I hope I got that right. Uh, <laughs> forgive me if I haven't. And um, primarily her uh, research interests lie in the field of uh, Buddhist philosophy and moral psychology. So uh, with that introduction, I invite Professor Kostochka to present her commentary on the presentation that you've just made. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sankalp. And, and thank you, uh, Professor Howell, for such a fascinating uh, presentation and very thought provoking. Um, there are so many important threads here in this discussion, and what I want to do in my comments here today is just to just to pull out a couple of the strands. And so to recap a little bit, Howell addresses two important questions, and one is metaphysical, uh, and the question is, is there a self? And so to this question, he answers with a resounding yes. Uh, and in particular, the self here is a thing that unifies our experiences. So in particular, how it characterizes in two ways. One, the self is that which has experiences. So when we look for a self like this, we're looking for the I in the I think, or the O in the cogito. Um, and both in his discussion of the necessity of the subject and his description of experiences as properties of the subject, Howell's commitment to this view is clear. Uh, but that is not the only central characterization that Howell provides. Uh, he also gives the following description of the self. Uh, 
The self is that in virtue of which it can be said that multiple experiences belong to the same subject. And this is not quite a mere elaboration on the first characterization. The two may come apart. And as Howell himself notes, a bundle of experiences unified in a certain way would fit the second description. However, perhaps there is a way to bind those experiences without positing an experiencer. That is the, I guess, what how it characterizes is the thin view. So I, what I wanna come back to in a bit is to explore what this thin view could be. Um, the other question that Howell considers is epistemic. Is there a sense that the self is harder for us to access than the objects of our surroundings? And that is the question that Howell primarily focuses on. He wants to explain how it is that despite giving a yes answer to the metaphysical question, we can nevertheless also answer yes to the epistemic question. And Howell indeed provides a number of very intriguing ways in which the self does seem to be more elusive than the objects of our environment. Uh, that said, the motivation for his concession is the observation that many philosophers of various traditions have found the self to be elusive. And in particular, how lists Hume, the Buddha, and Sartre, uh, and each of these philosophers finds that in one way or another, the self is not to be found in our experience of the world. And regrettably, I know too little about Hume and too little about Sartre to engage with these questions on their behalf. Uh, so I will largely approach this discussion from the viewpoint of Buddhism. And here I will uh, limit myself to the understanding of the early Buddhist schools, uh, but I will use, uh, still use the term Buddhist for just ease of communication. Uh, also in making this caveat, I don't mean to imply that the later Buddhist schools would disagree. I just mean to avoid like a needless generalization of Buddhist standpoint. Um, the issue is that the early Buddhist schools do not actually answer yes to the epistemic question. Uh, as far as they're concerned, the self is no more mysterious than everyday objects. Indeed, one of the most famous demonstrations of what it means to say that there is no self comes from the Melinda Panna or Questions of Melinda, a text from around the beginning of the common era. It is written as an exchange between Melinda or Menander, who's a famous Bactrian king, and Nagasena, a Buddhist monk. And Melinda Box uh, and makes fun of Nagasena's suggestion that the term Nagasena does not refer to an individual subject. And to explain what that means, Nagasena gives an analogy of a chariot. The chariot is not the wheels, it's not the pole, it's not the axle, it's not the frame, and so on for all the parts of the chariot. And further, it's not simply all of those parts taken together either, after all, a pile of chariot parts doesn't make a chariot. Uh, there is no chariot to be found. And Nagasena quotes, just as it is by the condition precedent of the coexistence of its various parts, the word chariot is used, just so it is when the skandhas, the elements that make up a person, are there, we talk, are there, we talk about a being. So the Buddhist would answer no to Howell's question. There's no special sense in which the self is elusive and our everyday objects are not. That being this ca the case, that does not take away from the interest of Hal's project at all, whether Hume or the Buddha claim special elusiveness, an argument for such a special elusiveness is immensely valuable and interesting. But I also wanted to bring this up, the, bring up this Buddhist perspective because it can also address some of the issues uh, in answer to the metaphysical question as well. So Howell argues that the answer to that question has to be yes, because if the answer were no, if thoughts didn't require thinkers, there would be an impersonal way to just re-describe the loci of experience, what we usually take to be the subject. And in particular, uh, Howell rejects the redescription in terms of there are thoughts here, uh, in particular between, because of the William James argument that sort of no matter how closely you jam people together, they will not be the same thinker. And so here, we'll not pick out individual thinkers in a way that's not ad hoc, uh, because you can sort of arbitrarily get them close together. But the chariot simile can be instructive here, I think. No matter how much you try to jam or stack chariots, they're not going to be the same chariot. And why is that? Well, it's because in each of these chariots, the parts are arranged in a particular chariot-like way. 
And moreover, each of these parts will have a causal history that tracks the path of one of these chariots, but not the others. So I guess why not think that the same holds for James's poor subject who are forced to literally bump heads? Uh, the thoughts here are arranged in a particular way, uh, bearing a special causal history with other thoughts here, and jamming a different arrangement into here without destroying this arrangement is not going to make it difficult for us to pick out our original arrangement uh, or to treat it as separate, even if there's no sort of capital S subject. And in that sense, the Buddhist doesn't only, uh, only say uh, no to the epistemic question, but also agrees with Howell on the metaphysical question with a qualified yes. Because we discussed the two notions of the self, the Buddhist can easily grant the second of Howell's characterizations. The self is that in virtue of which it can be said that multiple experiences belong to the same subject. The self would simply be the special arrangement of the experiences. Of course, here, our primary view of seeing experiences would be as parts and not as properties of the subjects, which is how Howell has been um, talking about it in his presentation. But the Buddhist can also put the O in cogito by saying the subject is the bearer of experiences as properties to the extent that the chariot has the properties that its parts have. So the Buddhist would just claim that it's, well, there's no further sense in which there is a self. And um, that fits with the cogito in form, but maybe, pardon sort of the expression, not in spirit. Um, and Howell's talk makes me wonder if Howell would be happy with such a view. Uh, even though this view satisfies the two criteria, there's probably not the sense of self uh, that might be meant when going looking for one. Uh, and so I would like to invite Professor Howell to say a little bit more about this you know, very elusive self and what further criteria, if any, uh, are required for us to have the kind of picture of self that he is pursuing. And thank you again for your talk. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kostochka, for your uh, comment on the wonderful talk. Uh, now, the floor is open to questions. Uh, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom, and then I will call you out accordingly as per the order in which you raise your hand. Sankar, I think uh, you want uh, Professor Howell to you know, give him the opportunity to respond to the question or to the comment. Oh, oh my bad, my bad. I, I forgot to make it. No, enough. Okay, th thanks. Yeah, I um, um, maybe some questions will come up um, as I'm responding. So that, that's very helpful. And um, so actually, I was actually going to mention the chariot analogy when I was talking about Hume's second quote. So when Hume has gives a second quote, he talks about, you know, seeing the the, the colors of the object, he sees the properties of the object, and he seems to be saying you don't see the object at all. And that may be something different than what um, the Buddhists would want to say, but it sounds kind of similar to the chariot point, which is that basically you, there's the parts, you know, take, a, take all the parts, you're not going to actually see some chariot that's there over and above the parts. And um, so I, um, what I am happy though with saying that. Um, the, the self could be something like a chariot in the sense that basically it's a matter of an arrangement of parts um, in some sense. Um, the, um, so as long as basically you can give a sense in which you know, the parts can be arranged in such a way um, that um, you, you get a thing there, then that gives me, then that, that gives me as much of a self as, as I want, I think. Um, and so I mean, while I do reject in some sense the idea that basically there's no way to capture it in terms of there's no, um, there's no, uh, if you say like there are sensations here, that that's not good enough. Um, I think that there's a, a sense in which basically you can view here uh, in such a way that it is good enough um, to where basically the here just specifies some way of circumscribing um, those states that you would want to include in the self. So it is quite thin indeed. And I, and I think that um, it's so thin and, it, and it, it, 
I'm not necessarily saying that's all there is to the self, um, but what I, I want to say that it's sufficient for there being a self or a subject. And so somebody who wants to say that there's something over and above those states, um, I don't necessarily think that I, well, so I do want to say that in, even in the case of the chariot, there is something over and above the parts of the chariot. There is the relationship that they hold to one another. In this case, it has to do with a lot of physical um, relationships and properties. Um, and so presumably those sorts of relationships have to exist in the case of the parts of the self as well. And so I think that probably once you have those sorts of relationships, um, you're going to get something probably that's not going to be just like the sensations themselves or conscious states themselves. They've got to be conscious states themselves that have some, they're bundled in some way. Um, there's got to be some relations that actually hold them together. And um, so it's still not quite the same as saying with Hume that there's nothing but the perceptions or nothing but the states. Um, there's also um, the, part, part of me is a little, per, I, I kind of get, I get the idea that the Buddhists would say that there's a sense in which we are perceiving the chariot. Um, and there's a sense in which we are perceiving the self. Um, but there's also, I take it, a sense in which we're not, because there also is a sense in which the Buddhist, I think, it denies that there is such a thing. Um, I mean, so there's a way of speaking, uh, at least this is one way I've heard it explained, and you, you, you know this, you'd be able to set me straight if this is not right, but there's kind of a way of thinking that posits this chariot, um, but ultimately, in the ultimate metaphysical nature of things, there is no thing that corresponds to that. Um, I don't know whether that sounds correct, but, um, but uh, if that's right, then there's a sense in which we don't perceive the self or we don't perceive the chariot because there is no thing there to be perceived. Um, and um, I guess I would want to say that um, there still is a sense in which uh, we don't perceive the self, even if basically we take a more nihilistic view of what underlies it um, because of this binding issue. Um, in the case of the chariot, we do actually see the parts of the chariot bound together uh, in a way we kind of are presented with it as um, an object with parts bound together. But in the case of our various feelings and perceptions and things like this, they don't appear to be bound together in quite the same way. So um, so I want to say that uh, that there's still a sense in which it seems to be the self is elusive, even if we follow um, sort of the Buddhist model. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the response. And I think uh, now uh, we can uh, open the floor for questions. Um, I would uh, strongly recommend like uh, students to ask their questions first before professors. That, that's like how usually we like to do it in the workshop at Ashoka. Uh, so please feel free to like now use the raise hand function and then I'll call you out uh, to like ask questions from Professor Howell. In the meanwhile, like uh, students and professors are taking their time to probably formulate a question. I'll use this opportunity to ask one like a uh, question that I have from uh, Professor Howell. Now, uh, it might seem a little uh, basic considering that at the start of your presentation, you spoke about how um, you want to remain metaphysically agnostic with respect to uh, what the like, substances of the subject of the experience and so on and so forth. However, um, there could be an interpretation. And again, it's, I would also attribute it pro partly probably to my limited philosophical prowess that there could be an interpretation of the thesis that there exists a subject to be one which would at least um, kind of go against positions such as functionalism or illusionism where functionalism is the position which states that um, functional states are essentially conscious states and essentially uh, to be conscious is to uh, act out the functions of what we consider conscious beings to be. And hence, there are uh, there is also the view of illusionism which says that we don't have any phenomenal consciousness, so to speak. So um, just like as a preliminary question, how would you respond to such a uh, 
possible question if someone may pose that by even stating that there are uh, there is a subject and that there are some conscious states which are the object like which are bound together uh, at the site of this thin cells uh, we are still making some metaphysical claims if not a very strong metaphysical claim yeah thanks um so that's probably right that ultimately I'm going to disagree metaphysically with uh, eliminativist of various sorts. Um, so if you take the um, if you take the illusionist to be an eliminativist, and I, I must say that I'm I'm not really sort of up to date on illusionism, but um, you know as long it, so I take the functionalist um, typically not to be an eliminativist. Um, but to be sort of a reductionist who thinks that conscious states are actually just the functional states. Um, and so that's actually okay with me. Um, it's just that basically probably what's going to do the binding in that case, I mean, there's real, there's real conscious states, they're actually there. Um, it's just that they are physical states that are functionally specified. And um, presumably what's gonna bind them together is gonna be some sort of functional integration. Um, and I think that that's, that would be okay with me metaphysically. Um, you know, even if, even somebody who was an eliminativist, which I'm not sure, like I say, that illusionists are eliminativists, but um, even if they are going to be eliminativists to some extent, it seems to me like they're gonna have to have some way of distinguishing between um, those people who to whom it appears that there's a headache um, and those people to whom it doesn't appear that there's a headache. Right. Whether those things are phenomenal states or not, it seems like we're going to have to have some way of basically grouping together these sorts of illusions um, where the, some illusions are bound here and some illusions are bound here. Um, and uh, I think that that's going to be enough to give me something like a, a subject. But <clears throat> if there's any strong illusions out there, maybe they, they're going to disagree. But I, I think that I can be okay with, with that, even though I disagree with it. Sankar, um, Sankar, your sound is gone. Okay. Oh, okay, my bad. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Oh, great. So, uh, Abhiraj, uh, I'll take Abhiraj's question since his internet is bad. So, he has told me that he'll just send it via chat. So Abhiraj, if you could just send your question by chat, that would be great. Okay, so um, this is Abhiraj's question and I quote, uh, you, uh, Professor Howell, you say that uh, perception happens in a way that takes attention away from the self as a conscious state. I hope I've got uh, that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Could you say more about that? How does that happen precisely? Um, so the only thing that is um, the only thing that I would disagree with in the characterization there, uh, I suspect, is just uh, incidental. Um, uh, I don't think the self is a conscious state necessarily. Um, uh, it could be a bundle of conscious states or something like that. But the basic idea um, is, is quite right that I think that when we uh, are aware of our conscious states, we're aware of them in a way that they sort of, as it were, lead away from themselves. Uh, and I definitely think they lead away from the bearers. Um, and so from their metaphysical bearer. So if you view me as the bearer of my conscious states or as composed by my conscious states, I think I'd be happy with too. Um, then it's still the case that, for example, my pain, um, while I think I am aware of it as like being my pain and I'm aware of it in some sense as a conscious state, I think it actually directs me, for example, if it's a pain in my leg, to my leg. Um, I think that uh, if it's a headache, it directs me oftentimes to a part of my head. If it's a sensation of the redness of a rose, uh, it directs me to the surface of the rose. Um, and so um, I, I think that there's something not unlike the way in which the sounds on the record um, are nonetheless produced by the record and perhaps are properties of the record, but they're unlike the shape of the record, which sort of directs you to the record. When you're looking at the shape of the record, you kind of see the record. Um, there's this further representational aspect that actually directs you to the orchestra, that directs you to, you know, what's being represented by the sounds that are produced by the record. And so my own view is that 
in at least most cases, um, our conscious states are like that, that they are actually representational and that they represent something other than themselves. Great. Uh, now, uh, Professor Namit, you can ask a question. Yeah, hello. Am I audible? Uh, yes, Professor. Okay. Uh, well, so my comment or uh, response to what Professor, our speaker, has uh, uh, I mean, described to us. Uh, as you draw the comparison that we are aware of an external object like a table or a or a lemon, and but in the same sense, self doesn't seem to be aware. Uh, so self is elusive uh, as per his description. Uh, I think there is something called pre-reflective self-awareness as Sartre talks about. And that pre-reflective self-awareness is always there Whenever we are perceiving anything in this world, or whenever we are engaged in anything while moving in the world. So suppose when we are listening to this talk and someone asks me, what are you doing? I will say, I'm listening. So I is always presupposed. We always have this experience of I-ness associated uh, with any activity or with any perception we indulge in. But if you say that this is elusive, the self-experience is elusive, it is probably because we are too engaged with the activity and the experience of self, this pre-reflective self-awareness is subliminal. It is too subtle to notice and it can be brought to the awareness through meditation, as I believe. So if a person does a regular practice of meditation, I believe this pre-reflective self-awareness can also become uh, quite much, it's, it's no longer subliminal. Then one can stay in touch with his sense of self while being engaged in the worldly activities or in perception of the external objects as well. That's my point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with um, some of what you say. Um, and um, maybe I'm not sympathetic with some of the interpretations of, 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 of what you say. So I am um, inclined to think that there is something along the lines of pre-reflective self-awareness. Um, I My account of it though is really quite deflationary. So um, there's a move that you made in your presentation of your question that said something along the lines of whenever we're involved, I, I is always presupposed. And then you said there's always an experience of Inus, or there's always an experience of the self. And yeah. I don't think I don't think one follows from the other. I, I think it is true that the I is always presupposed. Um, uh, and I believe that we always have. So I mean, my own view of pre-reflective self-awareness is that we have a standing disposition to self-ascribe our conscious states, and that's what pre-reflective self-awareness is. We have a we have an awareness of the conscious states themselves. And we have, of course, that awareness pre-reflectively. Um, and there's a sense in which we're aware that we are having them. But I wanna say that the sense in which we're aware that we're having them is similar to the sense in which I'm aware that like I have a back. Um, it's not something I'm perceiving. It's not something I'm getting some sort of a direct, I mean, I am right now, but, but it's not something that I may be getting a sort of a direct perception of, but nonetheless, um, I have a standing yeah. So, so my point is here, maybe we are making a kind of category mistake. I mean, self is not something tangible object. Self, might, self in my view, is a transcendental condition borrowing from Kant, which makes the condition for the possibility of uh, perception of external objects. It is not a tangible object, which, is, uh, which we go out and perceive the way we perceive an external table or bag, whatever. I mean, yeah. So I would view that view as being consistent with my believing that it's elusive. Um, so it, it could well be that it's elusive because it's a different sort of object altogether. I don't think we're forced to say that. Um, I, I think that, you know, what, what I want to give 
as an account of its elusiveness, I want to give an epistemological account of that. Um, and it may well be that it's the case that the self is not the sort of thing that we should expect to actually have represented in this way. And I'm not, uh, and I don't have any problem with that. Actually, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with that idea. Um, what I, uh, but I nonetheless think it's elusive. I also, I, I mean, you know, I, I am a meditator and it's, inter and it's interesting when I hear serious meditators, some of them, you know, really emphasize this idea that like, there is no self to be found in this case. There's no subjectivity to be found in this case. There's just the thoughts. There's just the things that you're having. And, and frankly, I can get myself into those moments um, in meditation. I can also get into these moments where I'm sort of self-ascribing them, where I'm aware that they're mine. And, um, but I have to say that I, I, I don't find that, I, I'm inclined to think that that's not where I should be <laughs> like in some ways when I'm meditating. But regardless, um, I think that it's not clear that, med that meditation to me, I mean, I, I'm not an expert meditator, but provides a univocal response to whether or not, you know, there's always self-awareness. To me, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. And that sometimes there isn't could be a result uh, of sort of a reflective self-description of our states. Okay, thank you. Uh, great, uh, Professor Sharan, uh, you're up next. Yeah, thanks very much for, for a really stimulating talk. Um, just before I get to my question, I can't help but, uh, but mention that, uh, you know, Professor Chopra was talking about how when he meditates, he sees himself. But, you know, this is actually very, a very old dispute between, uh, you know, B Buddhists and, and, you know, and sort of Brahminical schools. And it just goes to show that actually the, the meditation stuff doesn't really settle things one way or the other because you know they, they just had very different accounts of what what was going on in meditation. Some claimed to sort of see the self, and others that no, of course they just confirmed that there was no self. So I think we do need like philosophical argument to to, to, to sort of get clear about these things. I just wanted to push you a bit on your record analogy, um, and I guess my difficulty with it is that. Um, but of course, it immediately reminded me of C.D. Broad's analogy. You know, C.D. Broad was trying to talk about, okay, well, you know, people are pressing in and say, okay, what is what a sense data? You know, like, show us the sense data. And he said, well, you know, um, think of reading. You know, usually when we read, we just immediately go to the meaning, but there's a kind of special act of attention whereby we can turn our attention to the letters. And I, I took it that your record analogy was supposed to sort of be along those lines. But I guess my worry is that, you know, it seems like this is precisely where the analogy with the self kind of breaks down, which is that, you know, both in the record case and in the CD Broad writing case, um, it seems very clear that we can redirect attention to find this other object that we usually just see through or find this other item that we usually just see through. And, and one might worry that that's, I mean, that that's exactly what just doesn't happen at all in the case of the self. So maybe I'm misunderstanding the way you wanted us to understand the, the record analogy, but um, if you could just sort of speak to that concern. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and I, I think I feel the pressure. Um, so let's, um, so can, let, me, let me see if I can kind of rephrase um, the question in a way and see if, see if I've got it. So the idea is something like this. Um, so Right in the case of the CD broad analogy, when I'm reading, I can pay attention, but I, I can get to the point where I pay attention to the letters as letters, right? And to the page as a page. I'm not, you know, I and um, with the record, I have a little bit harder time, but yeah, I can pay attention to the to the sounds as sounds coming from the record, or something like this. Um, and so um, the suggestion is there's still. Are you suggesting that there's still a disanalogy with the self, and that when we pay attention to our states just as states, as conscious states, we don't find ourselves perceiving the self in the same way that we perceive the page when we perceive the right the letters on the page, and so the analogy breaks down that way. Or, or are you suggesting that we do actually perceive the self in those cases? No, I was suggesting that we don't perceive the self in that way. And I think that even the, I, I mean, I see the, I see the way in which you want the record case to be an even more subtle case than Broad's reading case. But, you know, you think of like all the, all the audio files were like, oh God, you know, CD quality sound is just terrible. Records is where it's at. And, um, and then, you know, they, I mean, you know, 
they will claim to see this, I mean, immediate difference between what, what is, and you might think that, oh, okay, I mean, there's a very real sense in which they're hearing the, the, the fact that it's a record rather than, than, than you know, that, that it's a, 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 you know, a compact disc recording. So um, I guess I'm not so convinced that it's, that it's helping us on the, on the, on the, on the grand staircase of elusiveness, you know? Um, and, and, and I guess, I guess what I want to say is that uh, they're just, you know, certainly the Buddhists will, might be tempted by the thought that, well, that's just like, you know, this is exactly the way in which uh, there just isn't a self because you can look all you want and you can pay attention as subtly as you want. All you're going to find are these chariot components, you know, uh, floating about. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that, that was the, that was the thought. Yeah, so I, 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 I like that thought. And I think that there's, um, that seems right to me that, um, so even when you pay attention to the representational vehicles, as it were, um, those, let's say, pains that, you know, are presenting something out and you recognize them as representational vehicles, um, it looks like you still aren't given access to the thing that bear the representational vehicles, the thing that have them. Um, and um, I think that that's I think that that's a good point. Um, I think that there's some cases, like in the case of words on a page, when um, you are you do become aware about becoming aware of the representational vehicles of the page. Um, I'm, I'm a little less convinced in the case of the record. Um, it seems to me like it's still the case when. So I, I think that I can become aware of myself in this following sense, in the sense that let's say that you know there's some disruption. I'm crackling really in my uh, sense perception, and it doesn't seem like it's going the way it should. Um, I'm a, I'm aware that that's my fault as opposed to the world's fault. Um, like if there's if I take off my glasses, right? Um, I don't say the world suddenly become fuzzy. I I become aware of the fact that in some sense I'm the representer of the world, and my representation has become fuzzy. Um, and nevertheless, I'm still not aware of the thing that bears the representation that has the representation. Um, I'm inclined to say that something like that's what's happening in the case of the record with the audio file, um, that they're hearing fuzziness in the representation and therefore becoming aware of the medium of representation. But they're still not becoming sort of aware of the medium of representation in a way that's not bound up with the representation. In other words, they're still, just like when I recognize my eyes are fuzzy, I'm still kind of presented with a fuzzy world, but I just recognize that it's actually me that's result the, 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 the fuzzy that's providing the fuzziness. So too, in the case of listening to the record, I'm inclined to say, yeah, I hear the clicks and pops, or I perhaps hear the dullness, um, but that fuzziness is still sounds like the dullness of the horns, or it still sounds like the pop over the orchestra. And so I guess in the record case, I still feel like even when you pay attention and are aware of the representational medium, in some sense, you're not aware of that which bears it. But your point really still stands, I think, which is the point that there still needs to be some further explanation of why it's the case that in some representational media, becoming aware of the vehicle makes us aware of the thing that bears it, in other cases not. And merely saying it's representational isn't going to be sufficient. We need more than that. And I think that that, that sounds right to me. Thanks. Vibhu, you may go next. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, thank you for the presentation, Professor. You started your presentation with, uh, you, you guys can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Okay, you started your presentation with saying that Satra uh, had that quote, I think, therefore I am. But when I, let's say, try to sit down and meditate, the experience I have is that I can't choose to have my next thought. It just happens. And I can't choose to not have my next thought. So I'm not really the thinker of my thoughts. It seems to me that I'm, it, they're just coming to me. So what do you think that does to your thesis? So I'm, I'm actually pretty sympathetic with that. Um, my own feeling is that I have, um, I, I don't have a lot of sense of my own agency behind my thoughts. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But, um, but so what, um, I'm taking to be sort of the essence of the Cartesian point isn't necessarily that he's the, the causal source of his own thoughts. Um, so it's consistent, after all, with what he's thinking that basically an evil demon is producing all the thoughts. Um, 
what he's not going to say is that that means that he doesn't exist because he's still having them. So it's not the production of them, it's the having of them that looks like it's going to prove the existence of the self for Descartes. Uh, and that's what I would take for me as well. It's actually the having of the thought or the having of the headaches. Um, so obviously, I definitely don't think that I'm the source of my headaches, although actually sometimes I think I am. But um, in general, though, there's lots of things that come to be unbidden um, that nonetheless seem like they're mine in this sense of having a conscious state. And um, that's the sense in which I take Descartes to be saying that um, he must exist because he's thinking, not because he's necessarily the originator of the thought. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Uh, Professor Raja, you may go next. I think we might have another student hand up. Um, oh, it's not a student, my bad. Uh, so I have a question here from Iman Sinha. Uh, his internet is bad, so he just uh, like sent it to me on text. So I'll read it out for Professor Howell. Um, the question is, and I quote, there are philosophers like Derek Parfit, who although believes in the elusiveness of the self, kind of moves away from the mere epistemic question in order to answer more relevant questions of identity. On those lines, is it possible to have a definition for uh, automatons uh, uh, on the lines of an elusive self? Uh, and if at all that is possible? Um, I think I missed that last bit. So, uh, we, did we talk? So, I, I got the idea that Parfit moves from the elusiveness of the self to, uh, to potentially to something more significant about personal identity through time. Uh, and um, then the second part was about uh, automatons. Is that is that right? Yes. Like on those lines, is it po possible uh, to have a definition for automatons uh, on the lines of an elusive self? And if at all, like that's possible. That's the question. Um, well, let me let me uh, let me kind of take those two parts of the question separately. And, and if I'm missing the question, feel free to to re ask it. Um, my main feeling is that um, in the case of Parfit, his main reasons for moving to um, certain sorts of skepticism about personal identity um, aren't because of elusiveness per se. Um, but they're more because of things that he thinks he should say about the passage to the Bible through time. Uh, and so, you know, if we go through a teleporter, do we survive? He thinks that there's no condition under which we wind up with sort of identity through time. Uh, the memory theory doesn't get it. The physical account doesn't get it. And so I think that Parfit would say even if there were no elusiveness to the self at a moment, um, nevertheless, we should be skepticisms about personal identity through time. Um, so my, my, my feeling is that the phenomenological comes apart from the metaphysical for part of it. Um, as far as the second point goes about uh, automata, um, um, I'm a little unsure what, what the question is, but my sense though is, is that if an autom automaton is conscious, um, then I want to say that it has a self in the same sense that we do. Um, and it may be that there will be um, some other physical explanation for the self existing. Uh, it may be the physical composition of the self is different, but that as long as you have consciousness, you've got a self. My inclination is to say that if you have an automaton that doesn't have consciousness, um, then actually I think that there, you, there's a sense, you could say that there's a sense in which there's a system, there's you know something like that, but I, I guess I don't feel like there's uh, much sense to saying that it has uh, a self. One could talk about various ways of carving out its identity through time, much like Parfit would be happy with doing. Um, and if that's what you want to do, then I think that that's, that's fine. But I think that that's uh, different than saying that there's a subject of experience, because if there are no experiences, I don't think there's a subject of experiences. Um, OK. Is, Wait, I, my bad. Yeah, uh, Professor Raja, you may go next. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk, Robert. That was fun. 
Um, I was wondering, uh, I mean, just a small thing, really. I find everything about the self so confusing. So I'm, I'm just not going to go for the, for the big elusiveness and uh, metaphysical and epistemological questions. But I was really puzzled by this elimination <laughs> argument. It seemed so bad to me. Uh, that I was wondering that I, I mean, what I, I I just misunderstood. I mean, maybe it was just part of setting setting the stage. But and I'm not uh, I'm not a radical empiricist or you know pure experience process. Like this is all not my my game. But I'm I, if I were, uh, I would be thoroughly unconvinced by it seems to me by by the argument. So if I just correct, may, I mean, this is how I understood it. Uh, the idea was if there is no subject. Uh, then we should be able to talk about thoughts um, or mental states, conscious states, neutrally without loss of meaning. And then the example was, so there's a Tim who hasn't ha has a headache and Tom who doesn't. And then uh, Tim in first, uh, or we should be able to say there is a headache and there is no headache. And there's, there's a contradiction there where uh, there really should be one. Uh, um, or there isn't one if we if we tie those to subjects. Well, that's that's fine, but it's I mean you just add here, right? I mean the these processes will be lo localized somewhere, and and the the uh, contradiction goes away. So it seemed to me there was a, such a simple and easy response available to somebody who is like of the Jamesian, uh, right? Who likes the, the Jamesian kind of a, a approach that um, I, I figured there was something, either there was something I missed or you just didn't want to take this seriously anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> no, I, so um, my view is that, my view of the thin self is kind of what makes the difference here. Um, so my view is, is that whatever is given by the here is gonna be sufficient to provide some self. So what the self is, what the subject of experience is, is just the relativization point that, the here is going to refer to. So in the case of here, right, the natural thing, so we do say of the rain, we don't say like there is something raining, we say it's raining here, right? And it's okay for me to say it's raining in Dallas, you just say, you know, it's not raining where you are, and I can nevertheless say we're con talking consistently because there's this implicit placeholder, right, referring to a place without actually positing something doing the rain. Um, and in this case, it's here and it's locating a place and the place is the relativization point for the rain. Um, my view is, is that whatever that relativization point is gonna be in the case of mental states, that's a subject. So give, I'm fine with your adding it here, right? But that here is going to basically serve the same purpose as an I and it's basically going to refer for me to the same exact sort of thing. If it turns out, let's suppose it turns out that like there's this dimension that each of us carries along with us, right? That's located by our here's. Um, that's not a spatial here, but it's a non-spatial here. That's a self for me. That's a subject of experience for me. Um, I don't know that I think it can be just a, a, a spatial here um, for the reason that I think that um, you know, Kostoshka, uh, Professor Kostoshka kind of suggested, which is that um, like with James, I think that even if you push people's heads together as close as you want, you know, the spatial location really isn't the matter. In fact, we can actually imagine, I think that there's split brain subjects or there's people with two different sorts of hears within one particular place. Um, and so the here is not gonna, it's not gonna be just a place. It's gonna be something like, you know, an organized sphere of places or some sort of a, you know, and that for me is en enough for itself. Uh, so I think that the reason why the argument looks bad is because you're thinking I'm going for something that's a much more robust notion of self than I, I am. No, so uh, maybe I just misunderstood the dialectical uh, position of that argument in your overall uh, story. I think then, so what I, I what I'm not, what I'm now hearing is you're saying, well, yeah, that is actually really bad. We can fix it because we can, you know, add any kind of relativization point in there. And that just is all I need, right? You said something in addition to that, you said that a location is not is not enough, right? There has, but then basically a, a Jamesian kind of perspective where uh, this relativization point is, you know, 
a process, right? Uh, that should still be fine then, right? So, so this is not off the table. No, so I, I want to be, now I must say that uh, when I say like, when I agree with you that a Jamesian view might be okay, I mean, there's various Jamesian views that, I don't know, he has this radical, radical self-consciousness view that I'm not sure is the same as what he had in the principles of psychology. And so there's different views you might mean. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so I want to remain agnostic about whether or not this is a process, uh, about whether or not this is, I mean, I think that you're going to have to have some, you know, like, yeah, I mean, as long as the process gives you the individuation criteria to distinguish why some thoughts are here and some thoughts are there, then the process is going to be fine being a self for me. Okay, good. That's that's great, helpful. Uh, not necessarily a bearer then, though, right? Well, bearer so I actually, so I, I mean, I my inclination, I you might be able to push me out of this. Uh, I'm not. I haven't thought this all the way through, but my inclination is to say that probably. Um, what, if it turns out that the metaphysics of the self turns out to be a process, then we're just going to have to sort of reinterpret the meaning of bearer to be something that is a part of a process or something like that. And so, um, you know, if it turns out that we don't have a substantival notion of self, then we're going to have to have a non substantival notion of bearer. Um, and so I, I think I'd still want to talk in bearer terms, but it just may not be the same sense in which basically, you know, it's definitely not the same sense in which I bear my, my, television, um, but also may not be the same sense in which I bear my hand. Um, there may be a special sense of bearer that we have to come up with for processes. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Raja. So there is one um, question in the chat from Professor Narmada, which is, um, is the elusive self the same as a no self? Uh, I don't think so on my understanding of um, the elusive self and the no self. Um, but uh, I've heard that latter term uh, used in various different ways. Um, so, um, you know, if, um, if if what you're referring to is, is like, I guess, what is the nada? That, 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 that would be the translation. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what exactly um, being referred to there. I think that Professor Kosbashka could help us more there know what exactly is being referred to there but my take is, is that's a metaphysical um point um while the no self the elusive self is an epistemological one uh and so i'm wanting to drive a wedge between those two things oh fair enough uh, i mean actually in this case i would have like i mean if professor kostochka has any views on this since the no self is also like a little into more, it's a Buddhist kind of concept and hence, um, if you don't, that's also fine, I guess. I mean, the sense I had was exactly the sense that Professor Howell had that the elusive self is an epistemic thing versus the no self is the metaphysical thing. Uh, uh, that's great. So um, yeah, there is a question from Professor Chopra in the chat which uh, says that, will there be no sense of self available to the person having, unfortunately, no sensory ability? What was that last uh, bit? Um, yeah, so will there be no sense of self available to the person having no sensory ability? No sense of re reality? Like no sensory. Like, yeah, uh, no sense organs. If, if no sense organ is working properly, uh, am I audible? Yeah, okay. Yeah, like we know in the case of Helen Keller, she was not having at least three senses, mm -hmm. uh, sight, hearing, and uh, uh, and smell, I guess. So, oh, okay. so yeah, was so there, I... that's her sense of self available to her, if not a complete absence of self, but yeah, so in that sense, I'm asking. So, this this actually, I mean, uh, relates to a more sort of positive view about what constitutes the sense of self. Um, but so I, I do think that actually um, cognitive states uh, can be conscious and one can be aware of those cognitive states as cognitive states. I don't know whether I necessarily want to subscribe to the richer theses that, that are sometimes associated with cognitive phenomenology, but to the degree that she was able to have thoughts or have any sort of conscious states whatsoever, I'm going to want to say that there is the basis for a sense of self there. 
Great. Uh, Professor Alto, you may go next. Thanks. Uh, so you may have covered this because I, I had to step away for a few minutes, but um, I was just wondering about the the, the notion of um, transparency or diaphanousness seems to play a, a big role uh, in, in your account uh, of the elusiveness of itself. And, and I was wondering um, if you could say a little bit more about that. In particular, is this something which is merely contingent, a contingent fact about the way we are about how, uh, or is it something that any uh, any creature, any any uh, you know creature for which the same questions arise would would have, uh, is or is is it? Uh, you get that question? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I get your question. Um, and this is related, I think, to the earlier question about whether or not. Um, I mean, I, I well, I don't. I, I have a feeling like your next question would be related to the question of the earlier question about whether or not becoming aware of the representational vehicles would be sufficient for becoming aware of, I mean, becoming aware of them as representational vehicles would be sufficient for us to become aware of the self. So you might say something like the following, that, um, so am I committed to the following view that basically were there creatures for whom sens sensory perception weren't diaphanous, that they would be able to become self-aware and that they would perceive a self? Is that where you're going? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's, I think that that's, very much the same sort of push um, from the other question um, that essentially, because my, my notion of diaphanousness isn't so diaphanous that you can't become aware of your conscious states as conscious states. I think you can. Um, so I'm not somebody who thinks that you can't. And so um, I think that somebody who was in a position where they weren't diaphanous, for some reason they just weren't representational, um, I guess I still would be inclined to say in those cases um, that they're probably not getting a self representation. And so I think this does push the pressure on the diagnosis in terms of just the representational nature of those states. I'm not 100% sure about that, but like it's a different way of putting pressure on it. Um, because it still seems like in those cases, it's not like the states, I mean, it's hard to know what it's going to be like for those creatures, but like it does seem to me like it's not going to be like those states bundled together in a way that presents an object. It just doesn't present the rose anymore. It, it just doesn't present. Um, and so it could be that the real emphasis shouldn't be upon really the fact that these states don't, that the fact that these states represent something else, um, namely their diaphanous representational nature. The real trick is that they don't look like they present this object. Um, and so unlike the brownness of the table, the shape of the table. Um, and so um, so I think, yeah, I, I think that that point, I think is well taken, that essentially that, um, and, and yeah, I, I think I think I'm gonna have to think more about why exactly, what, what the role of the diaphanous has played or was it whether it just drops away. Agreed. So since we have no other questions, I'll uh, take the liberty of asking like one final question, which I have for Professor Howell. So um, while we say, uh, like while you say that uh, the self is elusive uh, and uh, in the sense that it's not like easily graspable by all these kind of notions of introspection uh, that you've spoken about. And in particular, that makes sense, obviously, because if we are considering uh, the self or the subject of experience to be the sort of location or locus where um, like all these kind of experiences are bound together, even if we don't like, you know, attribute it in a, like the thin self as we say, um, then what would it take for like this elusiveness to just be like outright unknowability? Like why is it that we are stopping at saying it's elusive? Um, I do understand that the inability to perceive doesn't always mean a negation of it. Uh, however, considering that the way we are constructing the self is one which doesn't seem to even have like introspection or reportability. That self can't even self-report about what like uh, it is. So then like, what do you think it would take for us to kind of, you know, head into that direction wherein we say, okay, for all we know, it's probably unknowable. 
rather than just like saying it's a loser. Um, so it depends upon what you, how far you want to go with that unknowability. Um, so um, if you mean by unknowability that you don't know that it's there, you don't know that it exists, then um, I think that we definitely do know that it exists. Um, and I think we can know it, I think we can know it basically by the cogito and, and the response to the cogito is, I mean, the, and, and the Lichtenberg, the response to Lichtenberg wasn't so much an independent argument for the existence of a self so much as it is a response to a response to the cogito. And so I actually think that we can know that it exists. I think that actually we know about my general thesis that goes beyond what I talked about was that our way of knowing ourselves is by is as being the bearers of our conscious states. Um, and so um, we do have self knowledge and self awareness in a sense, uh, in that we know ourselves indirectly as those things which actually have the conscious states. Um, but we are still elusive in this important sense, in that basically we aren't presented as an object in introspection. Um, so there's still no ability, um, but there's not um, perception, as it were. So essentially, from if I just like if I one second. Um, yeah. So from what I understand, essentially, uh, what you're saying is that it is possible to know the self, but not directly as like we try to think, but more uh, for the, the lack of a better term, like sort of a third person perspective, that we know the self kind of not in as personalized a way as you'd assume it to be. Is that where the illusion lies? Uh, I missed a little bit of the last. I don't want to say it's third personal, but it is indirect. So um, it is indirect in the sense that we know ourselves by as the havers of the states. Um, and this indirect way of knowing ourselves is what leaves the metaphysics wide open uh, for me. It leaves the metaphysics of what exactly the self is just like totally wide open. Um, but it nevertheless isn't third personal in that I think I have access to my conscious states in a way that you don't have access to my conscious states. And so that access to my conscious states gives me access to myself in a way that you don't have access to me. So there's still a first personal, third personal asymmetry in my way of thinking about myself, um, but that's actually parasitic upon the first personal and third personal asymmetry that has to do with our access to our conscious states. Uh, fair enough. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think we do not have any more questions here. So we can call it a wrap. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Howell, for this wonderful, wonderful talk, and uh, uh, also for like being so gracious with your time with respect to like us going like half an hour beyond what we had stipulated earlier. And thank you so much, Professor Kostochka, for your uh, commentary on Professor Howell's uh, presentation. Thank you so much for arranging it. Thanks so much for having me, and I really appreciate the questions. They've actually forced me to think a lot more about my topic, so I really appreciate it. Uh, that's great, Professor. Thank you, uh, and. Um, yeah, with that, uh, this is the end of the second talk of our workshop. Uh, the third talk is uh, going to begin at 9 p.m. Uh, Indian Standard Time, which is in another 56 minutes. Uh, and it will be with Professor Ned Block. So like, uh, do join us in uh, for that talk. There's a different link for that as well. And um, yeah, hoping to see you guys in an hour. Cheers. Bye-bye.